only about 10,000 feet above those mountaintops. And all we could see on the initial sighting was the shiny reflections of silvery things darting around down there. I remember turning to my aircraft commander and my pilot and saying, what are those things down there? And he got on the intercom and he says, well, they're not ours. That's all I can tell you. What were you seeing in terms of shape and movement? The movement was very, well, I don't want to say jerky, but sporadic. The shiny object, which I would say from our altitude, looked circular. And they would sprint to maybe three or four mountaintops, and then they would stop. And then maybe one or two would come up and meet it, and then they would dart off in another direction. It was always over the Transantarctic mountain range. They would never venture onto the Beardmore or go to the other side of the mountain range. They would always stay in the same area. And they were always in the air when we saw them. We'd never, ever see anything coming out or going into the mountains, if that's where they were based out of. And they would always do fighter jet maneuvers. They'd take off, and one would follow him. And then they would both stop, and then a third one would come up. And I think at one time, we saw a total of six of them together. The sun reflected was very bright. It was like a pinpoint of light that you could see darting around down among the peaks. Did any one of them ever approach your plane? No. They always were below us, always stayed below us. We were told not to talk among ourselves other than just the crew. And just seeing those things down there, and being told that those aren't our aircraft is kind of mind-blowing where the fact is, hey, uh, what are these things? Why doesn't anybody else know about this? We had a mission that we had to do in a Australian camp called Davis Camp. In order to get there, we had to fly to South Pole to refuel our aircraft, and then from there we could fly all the way out to Davis Camp. We were told that we needed to get an airplane out there, rescue medevac, because one of the workers there had been burned badly in a boiler fire. And so we were trying to get there as fast as we could. We're talking a six-hour flight, three and a half hours to Pole, and then another three hours from South Pole to Davis Camp. There's an area on the opposite side of South Pole that was no-fly zone. That no-fly zone we were told was an air sampling station that we couldn't fly over because it would contaminate their air sampling with our jet exhaust, which was kind of ridiculous because we fly kind of high. <laughs> if you're air sampling, you're air sampling at the ground. Anyways, we were on our way over to that medevac, and so we basically did a straight line, and when we got about 5 to 10 miles from Pole on the way to Davis, we were told on the radio not to continue our straight line course, but to deviate a certain amount. Somebody mentioned that, oh, hey, there's an air sampling system out here somewhere, you know. So we can look down, and here's this huge, large hole in the ice, wow. almost like a cave entrance. But it was large enough that you could fly a C-130 into it, a hole that went down. We were told not to fly that area. We continued our mission and picked up our medical emergency and turned around and came back, had to come back to South Pole to refuel. And when we got close to that air sampling again, we were told, deviate this way so many miles and then turn back on course. So we got fuel at South Pole, made our way back to McMurdo, landed, and the entire crew was told to report to the skipper's office. We all got sat in this room, and this guy came in that nobody had seen before. The only way I can describe him is kind of a intelligence-type gathering individual, mm -hmm. we were sat down and said, okay, you guys saw this thing, you didn't see it. And he means the big, deep hole. Yes, big hole in the ice that was supposedly the air sampling station. We were told to not talk about it, ever, and that area was considered off limits for research. In your email to me, you wrote toward the end, quote, Talk among the flight crews was that there is a UFO base at the South Pole, and some of the crew heard talk from some of the scientists working at the pole of EBAs, an acronym for extraterrestrial biological entities, working with the scientists at their air sampling camp, which is the large hole in the ice. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, we're told not to talk among ourselves officially. 
But the guys, after a flight, they go to the club, and, you know, you have a few beers, and you're talking. It's like, yeah, I heard these scientists talking about that there's some guys there at Pole that were working with these strange-looking men. Of course, they put it that way so that they weren't saying, you know, alien or extraterrestrial, whatever. And that the air sampling station was actually a joint base with the scientists and the ETs. They were working out of there. Anything about what was actually going on down in that big hole in the ice? All the talk that was heard between the scientists was being overheard by one of the flight crew that was there. The guys saying, hey, two guys were talking in there. and They were talking about these scientists there going out to the air sampling area again to do their meetup with these ETs that were there. In your email to me, you said, quote, none of the scientists would talk to any of the crew on the plane, and they looked scared. That was a mission that concerned a camp that we had put in out on a plateau. It was probably a two-and-a-half-hour flight from McMurdo, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. We put this crew out there and then dropped them off in all their science gear. It was that team that we sent out there that McMurdo had lost communication with. They hadn't heard anything from those guys. It must have been a week or two weeks. You're supposed to check in every so often by radio and tell McMurdo that everything's okay. You can't just pick up a landline, so you have to do all radio communication. So after that two weeks that they hadn't been heard of, we got sent back out there to see where they were. Well, when we got out there, nobody around. All the equipment was still there. There were some snowmobiles there, but the entire camp was gone. We called McMurdo on their radio to make sure that the radio was working, and we could hear McMurdo fine. When we took off from there to go back to McMurdo, we kind of did a 15-mile circle around that camp to see if we could see them from the air, see any signs of any trails or anything going off. We didn't see anything. So then we got back to McMurdo a week later, Supposedly, these scientists had gotten back to camp, and they got on the radio and said, hey, uh, we're back here. We want to be picked up. And we went back in there, loaded up all their stuff, put them in the aircraft. I got the scientists in there, and they all got sat down the back, being the engineer on the airplane. After we got airborne and stabilized, I went back looking around, and the looks on these people's faces, it was just, (laughs) they looked scared is what they looked. And... I asked my loadmaster, where have these guys been? And he said, I don't know, I can't get any words out of them. They just kind of sit there. A couple of them, he said he had like blank stares, and he offered them food and stuff, and like, nobody would take anything. And so they get back to McMurdo and unload their gear. The passengers always have a separate ride to where the National Science Foundation chalet is and all the science support areas and all that. And their camp, cargo where we were told to put it on this big sledge and then this tractor would pull it back up to McMurdo and their camp equipment was put in a separate building and nobody was allowed in there. So basically it was put in isolation. Okay, it's kind of weird. Why is that stuff being isolated? It must have been probably a week later we found out with everybody talking in the camp, all the civilians, there's all the scientists are civilians and all the support people there are civilians military there was our squadron and they were all talking you could hear people and say, yeah those guys went back to Christchurch and nobody said anything and there's all kind of weird stuff going on they had a special flight for these guys one of our aircraft that's all was on it was them none of their gear just their luggage and their survival gear that everybody wears and they were taken back to Christchurch well all of their gear that the squadron had put into storage isolation area all got put on another airplane all by itself, no other cargo, and they got flown back to Christchurch. And that was the last that we ever heard of that. No words out of the scientists? Not to my knowledge. I mean, our crew didn't hear anything. And how many were there? At least 10, maybe 15. Were they all male? No, there was at least one female, maybe two. Am I understanding correctly that Each of the science groups that you guys flew in and out of the Antarctic base, they knew they were going to work with extraterrestrial biological entities down in that big hole? I'm sure it was all compartmentalized. 
there was only a certain select group of scientists that did that job and nobody else was privy to that information or going to that area. And what somebody had overheard was that there was an installation joint venture at Pole, not necessarily at the South Pole Station, but in the vicinity of South Pole. They were conducting some kind of project. Between extraterrestrial biological entities and the human scientists. Correct. Everybody's speculating, right? It's like, man, what did these guys see? Right. Why were they gone for two weeks that nobody knew where they were? It was like, man, these people are kind of freaked out about something, just wanted to get out of there. And the fact that they disappeared for two weeks. Right. It's like, are we going back out there in a couple of weeks to bring out dead bodies, or what are we doing? But it was hushed up pretty good. It makes you wonder, it's like, okay, so what is our government and other governments doing that we don't know about that's going on down there with visitors from somewhere else? And what possibly is still going on down there.